Have you ever looked at the shower drain and thought, that's definitely more hair than usual? Or maybe your ponytail feels thinner or your part line looks wider. Hair loss can feel deeply emotional. And it's not just women. Men feel this too. When something changes with your hair, it affects your confidence, your identity, and how you show up in the world. So in today's video, we're going to break down the three most common types of hair loss, what they look like, what causes them, and how to figure out which one you may be dealing with. And at the end of the video, I will share a bonus with you, a massive new study involving over a million people that uncovered a specific trigger for sudden shedding, and it ties everything together. Welcome back, I'm Dr. Maria Zizian, a board-certified general surgeon and an IFM-certified functional medicine physician. On this channel, I share health tips on skin health, food and supplements, functional medicine, surgery, and the latest medical research to help you feel your best. And if that sounds good, please like, share with your friends and family, and subscribe. So before we talk about any type of hair loss, we need to understand what your hair is doing behind the scenes. Because even when it seems like nothing is happening, your hair is actually following a very precise rhythm. So the entire hair cycle takes two to seven years to complete. And here's how it works. First, we have anagen, the growth phase. It's two to seven years. And most of your hair actually lives here, about 85 to 90%. The next one is catagen, and that's the transition phase, and it takes about one to two weeks. The hair stops growing and begins to detach from its blood supply. Next, we have telogen, the resting phase, and that takes two to three months. The follicle is alive, but paused. And then we have exogen, the shedding phase, and it takes days to weeks. The old hair falls out to make room for the new one underneath. And here is the most important part. When your body experiences a stressor, and that could be a weight loss, illness, emotional stress, a major diet change, your hair doesn't react right away. It reacts two to three months later. So the shedding you're noticing today may be connected to something your body went through weeks or even months ago. So now let's look at the three main types of hair loss. So first we have telogen effluvium. So, or we can say, why is my hair suddenly everywhere? So this is the sudden shedding that feels dramatic because you have hair in the shower, on your pillow, basically have hair everywhere. But telogen effluvium is simply the stress shed. Your follicles are not dying, they are just resetting. So the real life example would be, let's say you get the flu in January, feel fine in February, and then in March you shed heavily. And that delay is classic telogen effluvium. So how long does it last? Well, shedding lasts six to 12 weeks, but density recovery, so full hair recovery, six to nine months. How to support telogen effluvium? So when it comes to telogen effluvium, the most important thing to understand is this, it does get better. The follicles are still alive, they just need time to reset. So the real goal is to create stability while the hair cycle recovers. And that means stabilizing nutrition, stabilizing stress, and stabilizing sleep. Your hair depends heavily on protein, minerals like iron and zinc, vitamin D, and just overall sense of metabolic safety. So if the shedding continues for a longer period, it can be helpful to check ferritin level, iron, zinc, vitamin D, B12, thyroid levels, because low levels of these nutrients and hormones can delay recovery and prolong the resting phase. And while your hair is in this transition, gentle care really matters, avoiding tight hairstyles, minimizing heat, and giving the scalp a calm environment with safe shampoos. So the encouraging part is that telogen effluvium is a temporary response. Once the body settles and the original trigger is removed, the hair cycle restarts and fullness returns gradually over the following months. And if the shedding feels severe, prolonged, or strange, confusing, please talk to your doctor so nothing important is overlooked. So now let's look at the most common type of hair loss, and that's androgenic alopecia. Or we can say, why is my part getting wider? So androgenic alopecia, and it's often called hereditary pattern uh, thinning, it behaves very differently from telogen effluvium. It is slow, it is subtle, 
and it unfolds actually over years. So what it looks like in women, it's a widening part, uh, decreased crown density, a smaller ponytail, and just overall diffuse thinning at the top, like your hair feels lighter. In men, it's a receding hairline, thinning at the crown as well, and gradual reduction in density through the mid scalp. So real life example, well, Androgenic alopecia is, like I mentioned, is very gradual. So let's say you may be looking at an old photo and suddenly realize that your part looks a little wider today or remember that your ponytail felt thicker, that your hair felt heavier. Or for men, when they look at the photo, they may notice that there is like slightly softer or higher, their hairline is slightly higher comparing to the old picture, let's say from a year or two ago. And it's a kind of change that you only recognize when you look back, not while you're living through it. So common contributors to androgenic alopecia. So even though we call it hereditary thinning, many things can accelerate or worsen it. So let's talk about these common contributors. And of course, first we have your blueprint, which is genetics. That's very important. But then we talk about hormonal shifts, especially DHT sensitivity, perimenopause, postpartum changes. Then we have medications, including progestin-only contraceptives that some women are sensitive to and they cause hair loss in them. Then we have chronic stress, of course, when cortisol is going up, that does contribute to hair loss. Inflammation, especially gut-related inflammation. Well, thyroid imbalance, especially low thyroid. Iron or vitamin D deficiencies. Metabolic shifts, insulin resistance, rapid weight loss. And of course, environmental factors, toxins, and just in general, chronic inflammation triggers. So the cause is rarely just one thing. It's usually a combination. So also let's discuss there's something that is actually called the unmasking effect. And here's what it means sort of on real example. Let's say you go through a stressful event and it could be illness, it could be surgery or rapid weight loss, and then you develop telogen effluvium. And you suddenly lose volume and the overall thickness of your hair. So that decreases, as we just discussed. And that loss of fullness can reveal changes that were quietly developing for years, like a widening part or a thinner crown. And you didn't suddenly develop this androgenic alopecia. It was already there, just it was very mild. And the telogen effluvium simply removed the density that had been covering it. So the thinning didn't appear overnight. Telogen effluvium just made it visible. And that's why many people discover that they have two types of hair loss at the same time. So that example that shows that's actually not uncommon. So how do we support the androgenic alopecia? With androgenic alopecia, the goal is long-term support, keeping more hairs in the growth phase. And some people use topical or low-dose oral minoxidil, sometimes hormonal medications like, for example, spironolactone for women or finasteride for men may be considered, may be used if it's appropriate. Uh, they are prescribed by your medical provider. Additional supportive therapies are PRP, platelet-rich plasma, microneedling, uh, red light therapy. It, all of these can create healthier environment for your hair follicles. So from the functional medicine perspective, we look deeper at why hereditary thinning accelerates. The gut plays a huge role. We have chronic gut-driven inflammation, and that affects hormones, nutrient absorption, and inflammatory signaling. And we also look at the iron panel, vitamin D, thyroid function, insulin resistance, cortisol patterns, omega-3 status, metabolic health. So as you see, there's an overlap with conventional medicine. So as we say, genetics may load the gun, but inflammation and hormone balance determine how fast the trigger gets pulled. So the most comprehensive strategy is the combination of functional medicine and conventional dermatology supporting both the follicle and our internal environment. Now, let's move to the third type of alopecia called alopecia areata. Alopecia areata is completely different. It's autoimmune, and the immune system mistakenly attacks the hair follicle, and the underlying reason why this happened is unknown, and it's very unpredictable because the hair may regrow fully 
or it may go through loss and regrowth cycles. Or unfortunately, in some people, it can be persistent and actually this condition can become more extensive and worsen over time. That happens too. So what it looks like in sort of in real life, so they're usually smooth, round, or oval, bold patches. They have sharp borders and the onset is usually very sudden. It also may affect brows or eyelashes. So real life example would be, let's say, if you are styling your hair and notice a perfectly smooth coin sized bold patch behind your ear no redness no scaling just that sharply defined border and that is a classic alopecia areata so conventional medical treatment um, actually for alopecia areata is a targeted it's a targeted treatment because it's basically immune driven and these treatments involve corticosteroid injections into right into those patches to calm the immune activity topical steroids or immune modulating creams that they, they may help for smaller areas often systemic steroids are used for more persistent or extensive involvement medications called jack inhibitors that stands for janus kinase inhibitors are used and they are basically advanced immune suppressives and they interrupt the immune pathways that attack those follicles but unfortunately they have lots of serious side effects that may include high infection risk shingles elevated cholesterol liver test abnormalities blood clots and even heart attacks or stroke in susceptible individuals so jack inhibitors are not innocent medications and they are not for everyone functional medicine approach to alopecia areata now so again functional medicine becomes especially valuable here because 70 to 80 percent of the immune system is housed in our gut so when the gut lining is inflamed or disrupted the immune system becomes more reactive and less regulated which can worsen autoimmune conditions so we we'll look at gut microbiome specifically the gut dysbiosis then leaky gut or gut permeability issues, nutrient deficiencies, thyroid, autoimmunity, chronic inflammation, stress physiology, and hidden immune triggers. And again, the most complete approach is the combination of functional medicine and conventional dermatology, addressing both the immune system internally and the follicle directly. So now we have that bonus study that I promised. And this is a massive hair loss study in patients who were taking GLP-1 medications. So, and this study involved 1.1 million people. And researchers wanted to understand why so many people were losing hair during rapid weight loss. And they wanted to understand what kind of hair loss it was. And here's the key finding. So the rapid weight loss was significant and was specifically due to these GLP-1 medications like Ozempic, Wagovi, and Monjaro. So the researchers started noticing a clear pattern. People on these medications were more likely to experience collagen effluvium, that sudden stressful shed where hair seems to be everywhere. And they also saw something interesting underlying thinning became more noticeable. So in other words, if someone already had mild hereditary thinning, the rapid weight loss made it easier to see. And that's the unmasking effect that we talked about. And overall, there was simply more non-scarring hair loss, meaning shedding that doesn't permanently damage the hair follicles. But there was no increase in alopecia areata, which is very important. So that tells us that follicles weren't being damaged. The hair cycle was simply responding to reduced protein intake, rapid metabolic change, uh, calorie restriction, and just in general, fast weight loss. So the logical chain here is that taking Ozempic or similar medication leads to decrease in appetite, and that leads to a drop in protein intake, and that leads to the weight loss, and that shifts hair into telogen effluvium mode, so shedding appears two to three months later. So in conclusion, if you are losing hair, then ask yourself, did I lose weight quickly? Did my diet change? 
which was I stressed two to three months ago. That's pattern thinning run in my family. Am I eating enough protein? So because the key is understanding which type of hair loss you're dealing with, each one has a different cause and requires a different strategy. And as always, please consult your medical provider or dermatologist. Don't put the burden of this self-diagnosis and treatment on yourself. Talk to the professional because once you know the cause, then you can choose the right combination of medical care, hopefully functional medicine support and lifestyle changes to help your hair recover. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, share, subscribe. Until next time. Bye-bye.